Hi, and welcome to Springvale Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're glad you have joined us today, and we hope you enjoy the following message. Today we're here to praise God, not to praise anyone. <laughs> and um, and to, today's title of the sermon is The Mission of the Church. Now, I don't know if you can see that picture, but I'd like to show you some pictures that, that is typical of what a church does, you know, like a church lunch, right? Uh, or maybe a, a tea or whatever. Uh, and uh, I guess a church during its uh, service, uh, church service. And that, that's what churches do, right? A church perhaps that has uh, semi, uh, uh, prophecy seminars running through. Uh, and that happens. That happens in most churches. And, and we have other activities, of course, like fellowship, you know, like, uh, like socials on Saturday nights or any time during the week, group meetings, all this, all this activity going on. Do we, do we sometimes forget what the mission of the church is. Well, th sometimes, in fact, the church is made into a um, social network. Um, so we do a lot, of, a lot of activities. And nowadays, with, with the mo modern technology, we even, we even sort of like share on things like Facebook. And uh, our, you know, our own church, this church has a website. And we have videos and all sorts of things going on. But what is, what is the church's mission? Um, because we, in, in, in the midst of all this, all this activity, what is the, the mission of the church? L let me read to you what Jesus said. He said in Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That is the mission of the church in, in a nutshell, if you, if you, because these are the words of Jesus. It's a command. He didn't just say, if you please would do this. He says, go. He gave us a command to go. And when he says to go, he didn't say come, right? Because in the Old Testament, uh, people would, would say come to the temple, come to Zion, come to worship. But Jesus said to go. He, he meant for us to go to others and, and share what he, he means for us. We could say that times have changed since Jesus gave this command and that obviously God is not going to expect, expect us to carry it out. Is our world different to that of Jesus' day? Is it really that different? Let me share what some people are saying. In addressing the United Nations Prayer Breakfast, uh, Rabbi Zacharias, that's his name, he, Rabbi Zacharias, he's a, the Christian apologist, asked the question, how, how do you reach a generation that listens with its eyes and thinks with its feelings? And some of you who are pretty young, you would think, well, so? That's me. <laughs> right? You probably put your hand up. Because that, that, is, that, that is the society that we live in now. And you might say, is that different to Jesus' day? Let me tell you that, that, that it's not that different. It is not that different. And if, if, if the message of Jesus was, was very much what he said to us before in Matthew 28, then it hasn't changed. And probably the same message, it's appropriate to our society today. It hasn't changed one bit. It's like, I don't know if you've ever seen, through the years, since I, I, I have been an Adventist, 
I have noticed how, how the packaging on, 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 on uh, wheat picks has changed because, you know, we, we as Adventists, we own that factory, right? Do you know that? <laughs> and, uh, and, and a lot of people don't even know that. But we have been changing the packaging. But the wheat picks, I can tell you, they are very much the same as they've always been. They're pretty good. But it's the same, it's the same content, just different packaging. And what I'm saying to you is that, yes, we do have a different generation, but the, what, what's inside should still be the same, shouldn't it? I mean, uh, Whitpix is still number one in cereals in Australia and in New Zealand. <laughs> And it, 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 the young people like it, the older people like it. I'm just, I'm not trying to push sanitarium here. But, but what I'm trying to, the point is that even though we have a different generation, we still have a, the same product as a church that's still relevant to today's society. We might say, yeah, but it's totally different. Yes, but God is still the same. And the truth is, people are not really that totally different. People have sort of like, you know, they're a little bit different. But overall, we're still the same people. When I talk to a young person, and I'm not, I'm not scared to talk to young people or even kids. And you really talk to them on, one, on a one-on-one -on -one, or even to a group of them. It doesn't. I don't, I don't see a huge difference between how I was as a kid, because I still remember being a kid, by the way. I haven't forgotten. I remember every little thing. And by the way, I've always known this, and, and if you listen, young guys, know that when you see a, a, an older person, they don't want to be known as old. They want to be known as older than you, that's all. Because inside, guess what? Inside their head, they still think they're young. Isn't that true? Yes, see? Can you hear that? But so don't treat them as old. Because inside, they're still young. It's just, it's just changed on the outside. One day, you guys that are young now, that are 15, 20, 10, 5, 10, whatever age you are, you will be older. <laughs> Remember that. And, and it won't be long. I, be, I became an Adventist in 1980. And I thought I was pretty young. And I thought, well, some of these people are pretty old. But, but now I realize that I'm getting what I thought was old, but I'm just older, you know? <laughs> just older, that's all. But what I'm saying is that things haven't changed that much. They haven't, really. Deep down, Solomon said the same thing, didn't he? In, in Ecclesiastes, didn't he say that? Ecclesiastes chapter 1, he said, things basically are always, have always been the same. It, it hasn't changed. Things haven't changed. And I can tell you, they haven't changed that much either. When I read, this is in when I was a little kid. And remember, Solomon, he wrote this a couple of thousand years ago. And when I wrote the book of Proverbs, I thought, wow, this is phenomenal. This is really great. I wasn't even a Christian, but I was sold into the book of Proverbs. Because I thought it was so many great ideas. I thought I had a treasure there. And I read it. Of course, I didn't believe in God, but I thought the, the ideas that were there, the, the thoughts that were there, were wonderful. You know, but there is more to it than that. Not just good ideas, not just good thoughts on how to be with people. But there is more to it. Let, let us read some, some things of how they... The, the New Testament Christians were, and what, what they had to confront. 
Because sometimes we, we get scared, you know. We, we say, oh, you know, uh, well, I'm a Christian, but, you know, I, I, I'm not fanatical. Well, I'm not fanatical. Let me, let me, let, 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 let's read uh, chapter 16. And we'll read quite a bit, a bit today. Chapter 16, verses, verses uh, 16 to 23. Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 23. Now, Paul and Silas are in prison, we're told, at this stage. And verse 16 onwards says the following. Once when we, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. Now you, you'd say, so? Sp spirit? I, I don't come across people like that. I mean, the TV nowadays is full of stuff like this. Even the magicians that go around, they do wonderful things, right? Some of them you say, wow, how do they do that? This is very similar. Look, she earned a great fortune of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. Because the girl is full of it. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. This is what happened to somebody. I mean, Paul here was doing the right thing. And, and, and Silas, they were doing the right thing. Setting this lady, this girl free from these demons in her. And yet her owner, because she was a slave, wanted to put them in prison for that. What do you think of that? Do you think that this sort of thing doesn't happen nowadays? I can tell you it still does. Very much. Very much. Very much so. I mean, not in the same way, but very much so. Don't we have, haven't you heard of uh, a slave trading? Women's trading? Do you know what I'm saying? This, this prostitution circles that they have around the world, even people in Australia who are brought into Australia and sold into slavery to do horrible things. And these people are still around with us because that is the world we live in. That is the world that Paul was living in. And when you try to do the right thing by, by somebody, Guess who ends, who ends up in the wrong? <laughs> the one that is trying to do the right thing. And that is exactly what happens today in our world, even to Christians. Acts chapter 17, verse 1. And this is when, when Paul, again, was in, in, in Thessalonica. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. They were... There was a Jewish synagogue. Let's keep reading from, from this. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving 
that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. He said, some of the Jews were persuading and and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out of the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other, other brothers before the city officials shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They're all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that, that there is another king, one called Jesus. Do you think that that doesn't happen in Australia now? Do you know who Margaret Court is? Do you know who she was? Probably the greatest Australian tennis player ever. You know, in women's circuits. I mean, she's a, she's a woman. She's still a woman. Now, guess what? In her later life, after she retired from playing tennis, winning all these championships, she be, she's become a pastor of a church. Not an Adventist church, but still a Christian. And uh, by the way, after she retired, one of the, I don't know if you've ever gone to the city, uh, I, have you ever seen any tennis? Have you ever gone to see tennis? Any one of you? Right? In the city? Right? In those uh, where they have the Australian Open? Have you ever seen the Margaret Court Arena? Oh, that, is, that is who it's at, who is who is named after. Do you know what happened to Margaret Court recently? Because she did oppose some views that some people have who are against the scripture, literally. I'm not going to go into that with you. But because she did oppose something that she thought was immoral and shouldn't be in society. And in fact, she said, I'm not going to sort of like uh, promote this particular company anymore because they don't go along with what I believe. And because she said that, guess what? There is, a, there, there is a, an uproar now to, 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 to take her name out of that, of that place that is named after her. Why? Because she's a Christian. That's why. That is why. So don't tell me that we, we you know, the, the times of Jesus are not here now. Because they are. And that is precisely the situation that we're living in now. But we as Christians need to stand up. We are supposed to be Seventh-day Adventists with the last warning to this generation. Other people are doing it. Like Margaret Court. We... A lot of us are just staying silent when we should be out there proclaiming the same things and much more because we have a beautiful message to say, to proclaim to the world. In Acts chapter 19, verses 20, 23 to 32, I, I like to read to you this. <clears throat> Again, here Paul was in Ephesus. And he was preaching and trying and, 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 and doing exactly what the Lord asked him to do, to ma making disciples. And again, the Jews didn't like it. They didn't, li they didn't like it one bit. And I read from, from, from verse 23. About that time, there, there arose a great disturbance among, about the way. About who? About the church. About Christians. Because that's what Christians were called, the way. The way of Jesus. A silver, silver smith named Demetrius, who, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. He called them together along with the workmen 
in related trades and said, men, you know we receive a good income from this business. Doing what? <laughs> selling go the, go the goddess of Artemis. Sell selling artifacts that were, you know, idols. They were selling idols to the public and that, that was their business. And Paul was basically, by, by preaching about it, by preaching about Jesus, he was basically destroying their business. Men, you know, verse 25, we receive a good income from this business. And you see and, and he and how this fellow, Paul, has convinced and led astray large number of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made goods are no gods at all. There is, there is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine maj majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one into the theater. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples, the people that were following him, did not, would not let him. Even some, some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the, into the theater. Imagine that. It must, have been, it must have been terrible to be there. Those people were out, were out to, to get revenge. They were out to kill somebody. That's why they were saying to him, please don't go there. Your life is at stake. But Paul wasn't scared of that. Verse 32 says, the assembly was in, in, in such a confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know what they were, they were there for. <laughs> Most of the people that, that follow the crowd, they were saying here, just like in Australia, they, were, they don't even know what they are doing. Remember Jesus, what he said? Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You know, sometimes people could even insult us because we are Christians. But you know what? They don't even know what they're saying. Because if they knew who were, they were really insulting, Jesus Christ himself, they would not do it. If they knew who, who, who he is. That is why it's important for us to go nevertheless because these people don't know what they're saying. They don't know what they're standing for. They may say they do. But the instigator of it all, the one behind it of it all, is none other than the devil himself. We don't live in, in different times to Jesus' time. It's exactly almost the same. Chapter 18, verse 1 says the following, after this Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And I, and I read verse 4 because he was basically doing the same thing. He would do the same thing every, everywhere he went. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Verse 6, but when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest, and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility from now on. I will go to the Gentiles. He tried to basically go for, like what Jesus said to him, and it was for everybody, go first to whom? To your people. Then go to your neighbors. And then go to the rest of the world. And that is exactly what he was trying to do. He, he, this, these disciples were following exactly what Jesus had said to do. And, uh, and guess in verses 9 and 10, we're told, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, 
Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. Guess what? I think that Jesus, Jesus would tell us the same thing. Do not be scared to speak. And I'm sure that Paul was a little bit scared. Because after all, who wouldn't be scared? When your life is at stake, who wouldn't be? Because in this city, he's, they were, God said to him, there are many people. And I think that if Jesus was here today, he would tell us the same thing. In this city of Melbourne, in your suburb, in your neighborhood, there are many who need to listen about Jesus and his message. Because if we're thinking about the three angels' messages, if you are a good Adventist, the, f the first message really in, in, you know, summarizes the, the whole three messages. It is about going with the gospel, the everlasting gospel. And everything that follows from there is just a, an outcome of that. When people s grab onto that, guess what? They will be confronted with either following God or following the enemy of God which is our second and third message. And so we need to go there. We need to, as, as, as his people, we need to, you know, not bash them over the head with, 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 with the Bible. We need to bash them over the head with wo the words that come from God and come from a life that is lived for Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 5, verses 6 to 9, you know, we're given some extra comfort there. Because it is not an easy place to be in. Just like in, 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 in Peter's time, in Paul's time, it is the same thing in today's time. We're facing the same enemy. There are lions out there. People that are out there to, 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 to destroy us if, if possible. But it's not everybody. And, uh, and in, in First Peter... 5 verse, verses 6 to 9, we're told, Humble yourselves before God and the God's mighty hand that he may lift, lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Is this true for today? Of course it is. The devil, just like we see in the picture, symbolized by, by lions or a lion, is roaring. And that is exactly what they do to animals. They roar. But guess what? This humble, humble buffalo, they stand together. They know who they are. They have faced this enemy before. They stand together. And guess what? They can, they can resist the devil and put him away. And they have to flee. They have to flee. You know, when God is with you, there is nothing that can be against you. Especially when as Christians, you know, we're Seventh-day Adventists, we stand together. And we, we do this together as one. And there is nothing that will stop God's work on this place. Let me tell you about a story of this person. Who, by the way, never I don't think she's ever become a Christian. But nevertheless, this person was a politician during the 90s and during the, the, the early 2000s. And uh, in 2002, she was, she, was, she was trying to become, she was trying to become the president of Colombia. And she has, she has both a Colombian uh, he heritage and also she, she also she has a, a citizenship in, 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 in France as well. And so she was trying to become the president of Colombia. And as she went through, 
through this campaign to be elected, somehow these people kidnapped her. And they took her deep. These people were guerrillas. I don't know if you know who. They're not guerrillas, they're guerrillas. They're peop these people took them into the Amazon jungle, deep into the Amazon jungle. And she, she was not able to go get away from them from six, for six years, from 2002 till 2008. She was totally, she totally disappeared. And she suffered not just uh, the humiliation of being kidnapped, but also she suffered trauma. And they tortured her. And on top of that, they, they, they physically violated her as a, as a woman. And uh, through all this deprivation, you would think that she would give up. She tried to escape five times. And she said, you know, in her own interviews that she's given since then, that she would rather die trying to escape than stay there because it was a horrible place to be in. Many, for, for days at a time, she said, for months at a time, they had to stay in just very little confined places. Just, you know, just a little place like this. And she just had to stay there for months like an animal that couldn't even move. Till eventually in 2008, there were some agents, you know, secret agents from, from the government that infiltrated into this guerrilla, into this group of people who were holding her, not only her, but a, a number of other hostages. Because these people were holding her, you know, to sort of like to bargain with the government for the release of other prisoners that they, you know, of their own. So that's what they were trying to do with, the, with this person and the other prisoners as well. So they were important political prisoners that they had. Anyway, they infiltrated this group and, and they managed somehow to, to trick the, the guerrillas into letting them take the captives into a helicopter so they could move them to a better place. So nobody could find them. Anyway, they took them in the helicopter, and they thought, surely the place we are going to go to now, all the captives, including Ingrid, is going to be a worse place. But when they were in the plane flying, heading towards the capital city in Colombia, one of them shouted, you are free because we are the army of, the Colum of, of Colombia. We managed to infiltrate this place, and all of us here are here to free you. Imagine how those people felt. Imagine to be free like that, after all the humiliation, after all this st stuff going on in her life. She, was, she eventually managed to be free from her, from her captors, from her injuries, humiliation, you know, plus humiliation. Deprivation plus deprivation. And uh, you would think, well, that is wonderful. But you know, I remember when I was, when the Lord Jesus came into my life. And I, and I, and I know many people here today we, we have been set free from something worse than, 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 than what happened to Ingrid. But sometimes we think that being set free from sin is nothing. The, 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 the thing is, when I was set free by the Lord, I thought, how come I, I never, I never knew this before? I am thankful, you know, when I, when I came to the Lord, I thought, wow, this is wonderful. I want, to do, I want to tell people for the rest of my life. Why didn't anyone tell me before? How come I didn't know? And I think that somebody like Ingrid, if she ever finds about who, who 
the Lord Jesus is. And somebody tells her, I wondered how freer she would feel. Because when I found the Lord Jesus, I, I went through something similar. I was freed from Chile, from, from, from literally for be, from being persecuted politically. But when I, when I was freed from, 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 from this body, from this body of sin, and the Lord gave me the freedom in Christ, I felt on top of the world. I thought there is nothing else better. I thought, this is it. You know, sometimes when we are in church, we look at the world and we say, oh, that's, that's a wonderful, I want to have what they have. But guess what? That is fake. That is fake. That is not the real thing. God is waiting for those who have been set free like us to, to make a stand and not be afraid. We are plagued with philosophers, People that talk about it. We, when we need more doers of the world, you know, philosophers just speak about it. They speak about it. They philosophize. They, they say wonderful words about how things should be. Like Leo Tolstoy, who was a novelist and also a philosopher. And Leo Tolstoy, I don't know if you've ever read, they say that he was regarded as the greatest and still regarded by a lot of people in the world as the greatest novelist. I'm saying novelist. I'm not saying anything else because I'm sure that you have your favorites if you're into literature. The greatest novelist of all time believed, he believed that love is all that matters. He believed this, that violence begets violence, that no man has the right to take control over the life of another, yet they say that he is said to have never really loved anyone. He was a loner. I mean, of course he didn't know how to love. Because guess what? When you love, when you learn to love, when you have the love of Christ in your, in, in your heart, you can't, you can't wait to share with somebody else. When you've been set free, from, from the captivity of the worst person in, on, on ever, the devil himself and his, his, his angels. From that situation, when you've been set free from that. And it doesn't, make, it doesn't take somebody, by the way, when you, you would think, oh, these people that are into witchcraft, oh, well, they are set free and they became Christians. Wonderful. No, I wasn't like that. I wasn't anywhere near like, like somebody who, who practices witchcraft. In fact, I was, I was, by all counts, I was a very good person. If you would have met me, you would have said, but Victor, he's always been a good person. But without Christ, you're nothing. <laughs> that is the truth. Because he is alive. He is alive. With him, the Bible says, there is life. Without him, there is no life. And the as Christians, and I finish with this, and Seventh-day Adventists, we need more. We need to be true to the Word of God in the full sense of the Word and not waver in our beliefs and actions if we, truly, if we are truly living a new life in Christ. Let us stand together just like those humble, humble animals that stood against the, the, you know, the, the devil's of the lions themselves. And stand as one with Jesus and let us rescue those people whom the enemy has trapped in his, in his claws. Let us bring some of those captives and, and let them be free in Jesus. May God help you. Thank you for joining us. For more messages, information on upcoming events and church services, please visit our website at www.springvale-adventist.org.au.